Is this still your number? What do you want? Your interview with JP was good, that's all. I was nothing but loyal, helpful and supportive to you since the day we met. But you threw me to the wolves and did nothing to defend me when they came for me over total bullshit. Then you had the chutz bar to publicly gloat about my irrelevance. So why are you texting me now? Feeling the heat, are we? They are coming for you. I won't waste energy trying to sabotage or harm you, but I sure am going to savor the spectacle. Go to hell, Dave. I'm not even sure what you're talking about. I watched the interview this weekend and thought it was excellent, that's all. Okay then. Bye, Dave. You deserve every bit of what's coming your way. But yes, we are going to be scrutinized more, and, and I don't mind... Uh, I don't mind scrutiny. People are clipping things you can clip on Twitter. Here's yes. what you did, here's what you did, and they can expose right. them. So first off, you've imp the, the people at the bottom of this that are just consuming it are now able to get their voices heard to fight the bullshit. If someone came on here, if I come on here and I said something that was profoundly dishonest or was smearing of someone else, I would never hear the end of it. Hi. Tonight we're going to be taking an in-depth look at the career of political commentator David Joshua Rubin. We're going to take a look at where he came from, how he got where he is today, and all the nitty-gritty in between. You may have seen some of Dave Rubin's finest moments already, such as they are. If you don't know who Dave Rubin is already, um, hi mom, I'll summarize them quickly. Dave Rubin was allegedly once a stand-up comedian. No one else is laughing but you, isn't that weird? Somehow he went from this to being a host on The Young Turks. While at TYT, his show was called The Rubin Report. When he left TYT, he brought The Rubin Report with him. To date, The Rubin Report is his most significant and culturally relevant creation. Rubin himself used to claim that he was a... Uh, classical liberal. I can no longer call myself a progressive. I don't really call myself a Democrat either. I'm a classical liberal, a free thinker. And that he used to be on the left before they went all crazy. This was never true, of course. We'll get into that. His show has received funding in part from the Koch brothers, conservative oil billionaires, and now is part of Blaze TV, a conservative media company founded and ran by Glenn Beck. Oh, he's also a gay man. I'm bringing this up now, but don't worry. He's not going to let you forget it. In short, he has completely sold out any integrity he once had to the GOP. Styling himself as a gay ex-liberal is a sweet gravy train to make a lot of MAGA money. He also tries to portray himself as an intellectual, which is something that conservatives desperately desire, but completely lack. But he fails so, so miserably at it. You'll see. You'll see. You'll all see. Um, that's just a summary. You can leave an angry comment now if you'd like. Everything else is basically just details and jokes. I don't want to give the impression that I'm just reading from Ruben's Wikipedia page, but we need to cover his early life and career. Well, technically, the very first thing he did was in 1999 when he was an intern on The Daily Show. But the only source I have for this are these tweets. It's not an academic source, but I'm afraid it's the best I've got. All the way back in the year of our Lord 2000, David! Rubin, and some friends of his who worked at NBC Studios and 30 Rockefeller Plaza made a parody of late night shows they called The Anti Show, using a mock-up studio set that was just there for the tour. Of course, Mr. Rubin and Mr. Tavani said, they'd like something greater to happen. From the time they taped their first show, The Anti Show gang have tried to get the show business community to notice. They sent the tape to NBC late night honcho Rick Ludwin. Nothing. They sent it to Comedy Central and HBO. Boopkiss. They sent it to Showtime. And though Showtime brought them in for a meeting, to date they haven't gotten a deal. In 2004, hey, wait a second, the Wikipedia page has the year wrong. Ruben was a co-founder of a comedy club known as The Comedy Company. Wow, that's a unique name for a comedy club that was going to be easy to find on Google. Anyway, it's a TGI Fridays now. I, I can't find any stand-up acts from it, so sorry for disappointing you. But I did find this interview. There are guys that have been there for 10 years because they can't get out, because there's nowhere to go anymore. There's nowhere to go on television, and it's creating this glut. First off, 90% of the comedians should stop doing comedy. Probably 90% of the people doing anything should stop what they do and find something else. But I definitely think that's true of stand-up. Yeah, Dave, I wonder if that includes you. What famous comedian is least deserving of his success? Leno is everything that's wrong with entertainment. 
and I know Leto can crush me if he reads this, but you've got to have some sort of integrity. Being a comedian is not about promoting bullshit. The Biden administration is spending excessively while killing energy jobs and dragging down or dragging out lockdowns. This can be catastrophic for the American dollar, which is why it's smart to invest in things that are real with intrinsic value, which is why I'm encouraging you guys to invest in gold. The Wikipedia page also says he was a co-founder of Joe Franklin's Comedy Cup, but the source provided doesn't actually say that. These tweets are all I have. During this time, between 2003 and 2011, Dave Rubin had a blog. While it's kind of a neat time capsule, it, he also has a few racist blog posts in here. I'm sitting next to a woman who is interviewing another woman to be the nanny of her twin girls. The nanny came here from Jamaica and in a wonderful twist of fate, recently left a family that also had a set of twin girls. Apparently, she left that family because she ate the children in a bizarre cult ritual that really upset the parents parents. Actually, there is nothing bizarre about it. Many cults have rituals different from our own, more accepted ones. I'm simply not going to judge that Jamaican child-eating nanny. Not today, not any day. A Jamaican cannibal nanny, huh? Hey Dave, do you by any chance have her number? In American news, it looks like we're going to sell some major ports to a company run by the United Arab Emirates. Everyone is making a big deal about it, as if giving control of our ports to an Arab country is a problem. But frankly, I think the Arabs have earned our respect and trust. Um... I'm gonna have to retract that sentence. I turned on CNN while writing that, and some Arabs just burned down a Chuck E. Cheese's in Pakistan. Hell will freeze over before I have people like that in charge of my ports. So what, were, were, were the Arabs on vacation, or? I guess some of you may not know this, so I'll say it. Um, Pakistan is not an Arabic state. The people there are also not ethnically Arabic. But they are Muslim. That's why Ruben said this. In 2007, Ruben did a podcast called The Ben and Dave Show with co-host Ben Harvey. I couldn't find it streaming online, but the Wayback Machine has some of it. All right, yes, welcome to the show. Have you caught the uh, the fever yet? The the Ben and Dave Show fever? I don't they I mean, we just started. They couldn't have caught the fever yet. Oh, shit. Here TV canceled the show, but the two carried on and moved the podcast to Sirius XM. They renamed it to The Six Pack. It ran from 2009 to 2012. Hey, look at this. Their YouTube page is still up. Wow. They even interviewed Donald Trump Jr. in 2012. Ruben would interview him again in 2019. Except that interview got more than just 1,000 views. It's kind of neat how far he's come. It's like it's come full circle. The original podcast clearly didn't go that far. Still, I wonder what other people they might have had on. Let's check out their website. Oh. Sixpackradio.com is now just pornography. This is what happens when you let your old domain registrations expire. Speaking of which, I have registered DavidJoshuaRubin.com. Go check it out. Once upon a time, Dave Rubin was an aspiring comedian. I am so sorry for what I am about to do to you. This girl's reading everything. You just want to read. I feel like that would, if you read a lot, you'd become bisexual. Like, you just keep reading, and then one day you get, I don't know, some words, and then... Okay. This is from a show called Hot Gay Comics. Ruben was the host. I've watched every agonizing moment of this show. I hope you people appreciate what I do for this channel. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe! As I walked out, one of the comedians said to me, how gay are you going to be for this show? Which I think, that's... That's a sign, don't you think? Okay, we'll edit laughter in there. Please clap. Now, I'm not bringing this old stuff up just to make fun of him, although I guess I am doing that. I mean, what is the deal with Dave Rubin? We're bringing this up so you get an idea of what kind of person Dave Rubin is. Because fundamentally, I think Dave Rubin is still the same kind of person he was back then. Dave Rubin created his YouTube channel, The Rubin Report, in September 2012. Only a few months later, in February 2013, Dave Rubin and The Rubin Report became the newest additions to the progressive internet network, The Young Turks. My name is Dave Rubin. I am the newest host here on The Young Turks Network. We're doing a show called The Rubin Report. My last name's Rubin. It just kind of worked out perfectly. It was uh, me or Rubin Stuttered. I work uh, cheaper. Look, I'll spare you the torment. Dave Rubin's content at TYT is extremely boring. More so than TYT normally is. You have things to do. This is the internet. You probably have porn open right now. I, I know what you're doing. 
Wait, what? Also, the Young Turks have 41,000 videos. Mad respect to the grind. Hello, good people of YouTube. My name's Dave Rubin. I am the newest host here at the Young Turks Network. This is the Rubin Report. My name's Rubin. It worked. It was nice. It was me or Rubin stuttered. He works cheaper, yet they still went with me. Pretty good. This is his second video and he made the same joke already. Oh my God. The early Rubin Report was, well, Dave Rubin was the host and he would bring on a few of his uh, friends. I don't know who most of these people are. And they just have a friendly chat about whatever was going on in the news that day. But one fateful day, Dave Rubin tried a different format. Hey guys, so I wanted to chime in on this Ben Affleck, Sam Harris, Bill Maher episode from real time about 10 days ago. Uh oh. All right, so that being said, we're gonna show you the full thing here because I think a lot of the selective editing of what I've seen has been part of the problem. So we're gonna show you the full thing and I'm just gonna chime in as we go along. Here's real time, here we go. At least it got more views than the time he tried to answer people's questions from Twitter. Mike Reginatum, uh, you ever shit in your pants as an adult? Uh, good question. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, I had just started going to, uh, just started working out. Uh, and uh, I was taking creatine, uh, which is like uh, some kind of, I don't know, it's supposed to do something for your muscles, taking a little creatine. And uh, you know, it makes your stomach nuts and it's a lot of water. I think you're holding a lot of water. And I, was, I got out of the subway and I was like, oh man, I gotta go. And my, my apartment was about four blocks away from the subway. And uh, I ran, I mean, I really, I did everything I could do. There was a, a, a tiny skid mark. Personally, I pull a Caitlyn Bennett about twice a month. Yeah. So your question originally yeah. was, what's my what, advice? Yeah, what's was your that... advice? You like the red wine. Yeah, so what I, else I you like, like the red wine. I used to be a huge pothead. I yeah. was a huge, for about five years, I only went to college oh. for four years, but then I took it, I kept it for another Mazel year. Um, yeah, I was a major, major pothead. This had a sponsor, and that's Jimmy Dore. Jimmy Dore and Dave Rubin walk into a bar, and everyone else fucking leaves. Anyone here ever take ecstasy? I've, uh, yeah. yeah, but it didn't do anything for me, but uh, yeah. you? Uh, I took Molly yeah, about, si stuff. about six months ago for the first time. <gasps> How was it? Um, Where through were you? through uh, someone that may have something to do with this company. A lot of things are starting to make sense. Rubin would continue to work at the Young Turks until 2015. This is one of his last TYT videos. E even the times that we challenged each other, like it was great. It was always great. And I hope we continue to do that. And I yep. hope you'll come on my show at Riot. And I hope I'm welcome back here. And uh, Oh, no, and, no, you're done. Let's yeah, just be honest. Oh, that, that's that. it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> just kidding. This is what they really said. All right. Anyway, Dave, um, I won't be here tomorrow. So I uh, wanted to say good luck. Great. Yeah, thank you for all the great work you did at TYT. Super appreciate it. We're positive. We're going to do great stuff at Riot. Uh, so God bless. Uh, well, thank you. And, as friendly uh, as they are, you know, this I, is uh, the last we ever see of this side of Mr. Rubin. He and his career were about to change. One who sits amongst us has already betrayed me this night. Who? Who? Who, who can it be? Judas! Mm. And Jank, who, who was my boss and a, and a, and a friend and, and someone that I looked up to in a lot of ways, they've all acted genuinely badly. I do think there is this fucking twisting of the mustache evil kind of thing. You can't, these are, these are people that are, that are supposed to be journalists or in, in some space where truth and honesty is supposed to exist. They can't keep fucking it up. You know what I mean? Like yeah. at some point, I think you cross the threshold where now it's intentional. And I think we're, I, I think we're way past that point. So at the very personal level, I can tell you, so you've had Jenk on, he was my former boss for two years at TYT. He, watched the original thing with Sam, and then sat down with Sam for three hours. Right. Did, did you see any yes, of that? Yes, I did. I watched the whole thing. Three hours. I watched that thing. I was working for him at the time. Literally, like my, I was like this the entire time because it, I was having a headache because I could not believe that this person that I work for, who I respect, who I play basketball with every Sunday, that he was so dense to the ideas that Sam was portraying. And at the end of it, just as I said to you before that at the end of mine, I thought I had made this conversation a little bit better. Jenk only doubled down on all of this shit. Yeah, well, first, let me just say quickly about the new atheist thing. Um, you know, what, what he and many other people in this space have done with new atheists is, the, is literally the most disingenuous, dishonest, pure drivel that you could ever come up with. So what they've done by, by 
attacking the new atheists is such profoundly dishonest crap because Mm -hmm. they're trying to make it sound like atheists are getting together and atheists secretly are racist. And as we know, Islam is not a race, but forgetting that, um, what they're, they're trying to make it seem like, ah, you see these atheists. I don't take any pleasure in, in, uh, you know, talking about Jank or I I didn't go to work for, for him or the company with, for it to end like this, you know what I mean? I, I intended it to be the best possible opportunity. You know, they, by helping me build Ruben Report, they, you know, allowed me to figure out what I'm doing. And I clearly know that now. So I'm appreciative of all that. Uh, that said, you know, he's he's been a genuinely bad actor in this space. I was on and they were showing a clip from Fox News and they were talking about how the black host, that he was such a token black guy. He was such a token black guy. I actually know the guy. It's this guy, David Webb, who I used to work with at Sirius XM. I'm pretty good friends with him. I had dinner with him last week. You know, we've all done that. You know, like when they showed like a Republican convention and there's one black guy applauding, you know, like, oh, there's the token black guy. But I realized that's actually racism. Like yeah. that was that was really a seminal moment for me that really changed my thinking. To be fair, I found the video that Dave is talking about. David Webb is a Tea Party radio host. He apparently gets paid to be the Uncle Tom of the conservative movement. Now, there's several of these, but he apparently has won the prize with his latest commentary on the Trayvon Martin, uh, George Zimmerman uh, case, as you're about to see. Now, don't take my word for it. You're going to hear from David Webb himself, and it seems like, oh, you can't say Uncle Tom. Oh, yes, I can, and you will too after you watch this. President's remarks kind of framed the story from the beginning. I mean, if you took that out, and you just saw Zimmerman, who was... I don't know what, Hispanic or whatever, and Trayvon Martin. You see a tragic case for sure? Yes. I don't necessarily see a racial case. Do you? This isn't a racial case. It was made a racial case. And you, you know, not even limited it to the president. What that is, is that's the nation's largest microphone. It's the right. president of the United States, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, all of those, the actions of Benjamin Crump initially, they all play into as Rosalind Brock from the NAACP, who, by the way, at their meeting this morning, their, the chatter at breakfast is that there's now 100,000 signatures on the deal. J petition. Well, the petition's great for raising the roof, if you will, on what they want. But in reality, where is the Justice Department and their actions on this? David Webb, first of all, uh, raising the roof. Nice little reference there. Like, you know how black people, they want to raise the roof, right? <laughs> Holy fuck! Dave Rubin was actually right about this one. Jenk, why are you still talking? Shut the fuck up. It only took Dave Rubin six months to start bad-mouthing his previous employer. I still find this a little strange. Generally speaking, in professional environments, you're not supposed to bad-mouth your previous employers. It makes you look like a problem employee. It makes you look petty and shows that you might be a disruptive influence in a work environment and that you might be someone who can't handle conflict maturely. This goes doubly so for Hollywood and the entertainment industry. A lot of jobs in entertainment are not earned based upon your skills, but rather who you already know. That's true for every industry, but it's even worse in Hollywood. This is how people like Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby, etc., get away with so much for so long. Do you think Ben Affleck over here is gonna trash talk Harvey Weinstein? I don't think so. No way, Jose. You know what happens the day he trash talks Harvey Weinstein? Do you know what would happen on that day? He's not going to be fucking Batman anymore. I studied film in college and understanding this was part of my uh, disillusionment with wanting to ever work in movies and in Hollywood in Los Angeles. Bye bye. Shout out to my ex-roommate. I hope you're doing well, buddy. I don't know how you're doing it, man. But the moment I recognized and understood this culture, I knew I could never be a part of this. This isn't me on a moral high horse saying I'm of upstanding moral fiber and better than you. Now, this is me saying that I'm a fucking asshole. I'd be right at home selling hot dogs in New York. Just imagine, for example, standing up to Harvey Weinstein before prison. Okay, it worked, but then the next time you have a job interview for another big movie, oh, someone comes down the stairs, it's Mr. Harvey Weinstein. And he says to the interviewer, ooh, yeah. Mr. Attack? Oh, he's a he's a problem employee. He doesn't work well with others. He gets into fights a lot. Suddenly, you're not going to get a job anymore. Hmm. How'd that work out for you? Meanwhile, the guy who kept his mouth shut about Harvey's uh, behavior, 
Oh, now he gets to be Batman. Welcome to Hollywood, baby! Just imagine you standing up to Alex Afrasabi, and then, oh, what do you know, next uh, next quarter, your, uh, your department is hit with a round of layoffs. You're no longer employed at Blizzard. And this doesn't even have to be with a higher up. This can just be with any other employee. Just being involved in a conflict with another employee is bad. It doesn't matter how shitty their behavior is, because you're the one complaining. See, their shitty behavior wasn't a problem, but you are the only one who has a problem with it. Ergo, you are the problem. I gotta get this fuck off my screen. There, that's marginally better. My point is, there's no way Ruben doesn't know this. By this point, he had worked in the entertainment industry for over 16 years. He absolutely knows how to navigate the culture. Now hold on a second, I believe that Dave Rubin believed the things he was saying. I don't think this was part of an evil mastermind plot or anything like that. And employment in politics does work a little differently. I just want to draw attention to the fact that he said this and repeated this claim multiple times on multiple different shows to multiple different people. Rubin said at this point that Fully burning the bridge and dwelling on this subject wasn't really his intention, but he kept doing it anyway. The hosts he was talking to, and their audiences, wanted to hear this story, so Ruben kept telling it. Can I please finally tell the truth about why he left the Young Turks? He wanted to make a six-figure salary to host a 30-minute-a-week show when everyone here, you know, because we work for an independent news company, was getting paid far less while working 12-hour days. That's why Dave Rubin left the company. And now all of a sudden, he's getting funded by the Koch brothers, and all of a sudden, his opinions are very different. He has no political identity. He is not an honest actor. He is not an intellectual. He is a fraud. You know, it's so silly to even, unfortunately, to have to talk about these little nonsensical things. Because I, because I, I like talking about ideas, not about people. Guys like you and me, our whole fucking lives, <laughs> we're gonna be like, we'll be in ten years, we'll be fighting the right again, and then in another ten years, we'll be fighting the left again. Yeah. So that center. So where do you actually consider yourself politically? I, I think I have a good sense, and one of the things we've been talking about here is sort of this new growing center. So five years ago, where liberals and conservatives were just fighting about everything, now actually there's a new center developing, and I think both of us are sort of in that. Now it would be very easy for us to compile clips of Dave Rubin saying dumb things and going, Look how stupid he is! And so, we're gonna do that. I quite like their new term, reactionary right. It's a signal that calling everyone far right and alt right doesn't work anymore. Plus, being reactionary is good. When you see something wrong, you take it upon yourself to do something about it. I'm reactionary about freedom! Hey Dave, let me help you out. Reactionary has an actual definition. It doesn't mean you're reacting to things. Being reactionary about freedom means you hate freedom. But instead of just simply throwing a bunch of clips of him saying dumb things together, I would like to point out a couple patterns in Dave Rubin's, shall we say, ideas. When Dave Rubin tries to explain politics and tries to provide a more detailed commentary on politics, the more clips you see of Dave Rubin talking about politics, the more apparent it is that he is completely politically illiterate. Well, I think there's an interesting reason for that that sort of brings the Solzhenitsyn story into 2019, which is that he was truly oppressed. This was a life of actual oppression, right? Now we have people that are walking around. Everyone in this room has this in their pocket. And if you have this in your pocket and you Turned off, I hope. Yeah, hopefully turned off. But if you have this thing in your pocket and you think you're oppressed, you're, you're very confused. We, we live in a time with such absurd freedoms in the West that are so uh, beyond imagination of what people could only dream of two generations ago, even one generation ago, especially with this, that people now are, have a perceived oppression instead of a real oppression. What the fuck are you talking about? There are two glaring examples that come to mind when talking about Dave Rubin's political illiteracy. One is his claim of leaving the left, and the other is his self-label of it classical liberal. I suppose a good start is this PragerU video Rubin did. Why I left the left. He also says in his book that he wanted to title it that, but we'll get to that later. Do you believe in free speech? 
Do you believe that people should be judged by their character, not their skin color? Do you believe in freedom of religion? If you believe these things, you're probably not a progressive. Uh, I already did a response to this video, but for the sake of completion, I'm going to highlight a few things to help sell my point. You might think you're a progressive. I used to think I was. My show, The Rubin Report, was originally part of the Progressive Young Turks Network. Yeah, we know. Progressives used to say, I may disagree with what you say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. Not anymore. Banning speakers whose opinions you don't agree with from college campuses, that's not progressive. Prohibiting any words not approved of as politically correct, that's not progressive. Putting trigger warnings on books, movies, music, anything that might offend people, that's not progressive either. All of this has led me to believe that much of the left is no longer progressive, but regressive. This is one of the reasons I spend so much time on the show talking about the uh, you may have noticed in this section that Ruben doesn't really elaborate on any of these examples that he gives. He just kind of brings them up real quick and vaguely gestures at them. So let's do the bullet points. One, banning speakers from college campuses. Two, political correctness bans words. Three, trigger warnings. And that's it. Now you may notice a pattern here. Mainly, these are all things that don't fucking affect any of us. But conservatives love talking about them every chance they get. These things may not affect a vast majority of us, but they're really good at getting your racist fucking parents who watch Fox News all day all riled up. This is also a gish gallop. I know it's a Brigger video, but in the amount of time it would take to explain why each individual example he gives is wrong, he will have already moved on to the next 20 points. But if you already agree and dislike each example, you don't need any more explanation. You already know everything you want to know. Why should you or Dave Rubin have to do the thinking? Leave it up to Tucker. Well, Dave Rubin, host of The Rubin Report, once called himself a progressive and even worked for a progressive news outlet. Now he says he's fed up with the modern left's autocratic tendencies and cannot endorse them anymore. Dave Rubin joins us from Los Angeles. Dave, thanks a lot for coming on. I, I wanted to have you on after I saw this yeah. amazing uh, video that you did that I did go viral explaining why you're at least shifting. I don't know if you're abandoning all your former beliefs, but you're reorienting for sure. Could you just basically sum up what happened, why you changed your mind? Yeah, well, you know, first off, actually, I believe the same liberal principles that I've believed probably since around 1988 when Michael Dukakis was running against George H.W. Bush, and I was in a, a social studies class where we were having a mock election, and I thought liberal was good. I mean, the, the issue that, that everybody's talking about, and by the way, I'm glad that I'm doing this tonight and, and with you because you're one of the few people in the mainstream that are, that are now talking about this. Uh, it's been bubbling up online for quite some time. and. The, the progressive movement is no longer progressive. What progressive would be would be truly liberal, meaning for the individual, not for the collective, for liberty. I, right. I would welcome all your viewers to, to Google what classical liberalism is. It's about the individual and your right to, to do with your life what you would like. Just so we're clear, within two weeks of the PragerU video going up, Dave Rubin went on Tucker Carlson to talk about it. If you didn't already know, PragerU is funded in no small part by conservative oil fracking billionaires, the Wilkes brothers. Dotting the road leading to the tiny town of Cisco, Texas, sit giant billboards blaring the beliefs of its billionaire residents, Ferris and Dan Wilkes, brothers, and the newest and biggest single family donor to the race for the presidency, pumping $15 million to Republican Ted Cruz's super PAC. The Wilkes brothers worry that America's declining morals will especially hurt the younger generation. So they're using the riches that the Lord has blessed them with to back specific goals. I just think we have to make people aware, you know, and, and bring the Bible back into the school and, and start teaching our kids at a younger age and, uh, you know, focus on the younger generation. They're being taught the other ideas, the gay agenda every day out in the world. So we have to stand up and explain to them that that's not real and it's not, that's not proper, it's not right. Note that these are not the Koch brothers. That's right, they are two completely different conservative oil billionaire brothers. Yeah, Ruben's taking cash from both of them. 
<laughs> Today's progressivism has become a faux moral movement hurling charges of racism, bigotry, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, and a slew of other meaningless buzzwords at anyone they disagree with. This is the most amazing part to me. These are all meaningless buzzwords. Ruben is claiming that these words are just name calling that the left does. He says, without a hint of irony, as he then goes on to call them the regressive left. How do you lack self-awareness quite like that? For these reasons, I can no longer call myself a progressive. I don't really call myself a Democrat either. I'm a classical liberal, a free thinker. Hey, 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 pro tip to all the men out there, never say this when you're on a first date. And as much as I don't like to admit it, defending my liberal values has suddenly become a conservative position. Or there is another option here. It's that you've never had to think about this before, and now you've decided you're just gonna be a Republican. Ruben also has an animation on his channel talking about what it means to be a classical liberal. Now, um, this might be regressive of me, but this comes with a trigger warning because it is cringe. What is a classical liberal? It sounds like someone who's a liberal, but perhaps a bit fancier, maybe sporting a top hat, a twirly mustache, and a monocle. Tea time. God, I hate the British. Putting the individual above the group not only empowers you to live your life as you see fit, but it also neutralizes the forces of racism and bigotry, which judge people not on their individuality, but on their immutable group characteristics, be it color of skin, gender, or sexuality. Dave Rubin would not have had YouTube success on his own. I am extremely confident in making that claim. Oh, now, this is not no, no, no. what the modern world is You're not an intellectual. So You're a fake and a fraud. I believe the same exact things that I believe in my Sadly, the left is no longer liberal at all, for it has traded in individualism for collectivism. But Dave, just a second ago, you called yourself a classical liberal. Isn't the act of applying a political label to yourself an inherently collectivist act? Thus placing us in an oppression Olympics where victimhood is virtue. This postmodernism, this cultural Marxism, or whatever you want to call it, can only destroy, it cannot create. Cultural Marxism is a Nazi conspiracy theory that Marxists have taken over our institutions and are subverting Western society. Postmodernism has nothing to do with it, but Jordan Peterson considers it one and the same. They are the postmodernists pushing progressive activism at a college near you. Now I want to be clear, I am not accusing Ruben of being a Nazi. I am accusing him of pandering to them. Look at all your favorite comics and writers and whatever on Twitter. Are any of them funny anymore? They're not funny. You know where the funny stuff's coming? It's coming out of the alt-right. That doesn't mean I'm a Nazi. This part of his video has a lot of it. The left is collectivist and doesn't care for the individual. Impression Olympics, victimhood is virtue, postmodernism and cultural Marxism. And the final line, whatever you want to call it, can only destroy, it cannot create. It's true that this and Dave Rubin are politically illiterate, but you know what it really reminds me of? It reminds me of Dave Rubin over a decade prior, bombing at stand-up, but still trying to pander to the audience. Is anyone anything else that I didn't get to? Do we have any trannies or do you got everything, nothing? Are you a pregnant man or a woman that had an alligator? What are you? Do you anyone anything else? Did, did, I, did I hit on everything? I did some research trying to find out when Dave Rubin started calling himself a classical liberal. I expected it to be after the Learn Liberty Partnership, but he actually started saying this a few months before then. I view liberal thinking and liberal ideas as generally good. Over the past few months, as I've explored classical liberalism with its focus on civil liberties and economic freedom, I've come to realize in many cases, liberal ideas aren't that far from libertarian ideas. However, I did discover something else interesting. After the Learn Liberty Partnership, the usage of the term classically liberal definitely ramped up on his channel. But the very first time the Rubin Report talked about being classically liberal, was actually not coming from Ruben. It was from Sargon of Akkad. I've heard you say that you refer to yourself as a classic liberal. And yeah. the more that I've been doing this, I mean, that's really where I feel at home too. I think now I have some really strong libertarian leanings also, but there's, there's, some, there's some play there. There's some yeah. uh, common ground there. But what does classic liberalism mean to you? Um, Responsible deplatforming. God, that's the thumbnail they went with, huh? Yeah, Sargon got points for the uh, Coke Bros Recruit a Friend program. God, I hate the British.
Empire. I 100% believe that King George sent us Sargon from beyond the grave, from somewhere within the depths of hell. While this was the first time Dave Rubin spoke about classical liberalism, this was not the very first time it was mentioned on the channel. From what I can tell, the very first mention of the term classical liberalism didn't come from Sargon. No. It came from Milo. Or simply classical liberals like me, who believe in freedom of expression, freedom of thought, liberty of, um... God, I hate the British. Go back to Turf Island, you creep. Now, I don't know this for certain, but I think I might know why Ruben settled on the self-label of classical liberal. You know, being British is pretty great because everything you say sounds smarter <laughs> than anything that you or I can say right now, right? If you're British, you're in good shape just by saying anything. In early 2020, Dave Rubin published his first book. Now with a title like Don't Burn This Book, there might be a question on your mind. Fire? <laughs> Psych. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Unless, of course, that fire is my mixtape. Part of the idea of titling the book Don't Burn This Book was that I didn't expect us to be in 1941 Germany where we're literally, you know, doing bonfires, throwing books into, into fires. But as you said, why do you burn books? Well, it's because you don't want those ideas to be heard. Well, right now there's a massive coordinated assault on my Amazon reviews and some of the online retailers to, to suppress the reviews of the book, not because they've read the book or they're countering the ideas, but just because they don't want these ideas heard. So that, I would say, is a digital or a modern book burning. But wait, Dave, what's that in your pocket? Oh, it kind of looks like a cell phone. So I have read this thing twice. twice. So let's just get this out there. This book is terrible. There are many things I could say about this book. I could go on for several hours. <laughs> so I'm just gonna cover a few of the main things. If this video gets to 10,000 views, I will do a live stream going through the book and all my notes on it. <laughs> oh God, it's gonna be, it's gonna be like 12 hours long. So when you look at the back side of this here, there's a whole bunch of praise for Dave Rubin, a whole bunch of quotes from different people. Dr. Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Eckhart Tolle, Peter Thiel, <coughs> Tucker Carlson, and Larry King. One of these things is not like the others. Okay, first warning flag going up here. When you read the quotes on the back, only one of them actually acknowledges the content in the book. And that's the quote from Jordan Peterson. The others don't actually acknowledge what's in the book. I don't think they read it. <laughs> Broadly speaking, this book doesn't actually provide you with anything. That's my biggest problem. It's kind of empty and vapid. And pretty much everything in it is the exact same material you get from watching the Rubin Report. It's pretty much just a bunch of his interviews and shows just repeated in the book, which is a little disappointing. Dave, if I wanted to watch your show, I'd watch your show. This is not your show. This is a book. I would expect something a little different. I expect your ideas to be a little more robust. That kind of leads into the other big point. None of the content of this book, none of its ideas are going to get it burned. I know with a title like that, you're kind of expecting a little more, right? You're expecting something kind of inflammatory. You look at this and you think, hmm, don't burn this book. Oh man. Oh, I bet Nazis are gonna like hate this book, right? There's gonna be some gonna be some good stuff in here, right? Maybe I'm gonna learn about some of the Jewish sciences, like uh, the theory of relativity. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm gonna learn about oh oh Das Kapital. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Some Karl Marx stuff. Maybe I'm gonna learn about you know the early research into transgender people. Oh, that's fun. No, no, nothing like that. No one's gonna burn this book. Actually, that's not true. Dave Rubin burned this book. I guess with the title like this, he was kind of hoping and begging someone to do it, and nobody did, so he did it himself. There's not really much of an action plan or anything else. The main theme of this book is, I'm Dave Rubin, and I wrote a book! It's a self-congratulatory, uh, conservative circle jerk. That's pretty much the only thing you're gonna get out of it. But to be fair, there was one part of this book that I thought was Okay, it was the only chapter I found marginally interesting. Chapter 9, Find a Mentor. This chapter is pretty much just Dave talking about when he first went on tour with Dr. Jordan Peterson. Wild as it is for me to say this, it was actually kind of interesting and insightful to read. If the whole book were about his experiences going on tour, that 
might actually be a decent book. I mean, there's still bullshit in this chapter, make no mistake. For example, Jordan Peterson is as well-read, intellectually curious, and academically rigorous as I can possibly imagine anyone to be. Well, that sounds like a problem with your own imagination, <laughs> but I've already done a video on Jordan Peterson. Don't, don't watch it. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's get to the, uh, the meat, I guess. The beef or the soy protein. I don't know what we want to call it. I don't know which joke we want to make there. There are a, a number of things in this book that like really kind of jump out at you. For example, there's a part of this book where Dave Rubin talks about certain issues facing this country. Rubin has clearly not hired an editor for this because it kind of goes into two separate chapters. Think freely or die, and check your facts, not your privilege. He tries to frame the second chapter as him providing different resources and different research and different data points to back up certain claims of his, but it's like, that really should have been in the previous chapter. This should be one chapter, don't you think? Anyway, among these issues, a few kind of stick out, like, I don't know. I don't know, I don't have a colorful metaphor. Trans issues. When I was a boy, I wanted to be a Decepticon named Soundwave. Dave, I thought you were a comedian. Why are you using the, the one joke? Now that's exactly how we know he's taking trans rights mega seriously. He's stealing the only joke conservatives know about trans people. But this next one, I don't understand where he got this one from. He tries to talk about foreign policy in this section. When it comes to foreign policy, we need a strong military, period. Okay, but let's look at an example he gives to justify this. The point is, if we don't assert ourselves in the face of tyranny, who will? It certainly won't be international alliances like NATO. Just look at what happened to Ukraine. It gave up its nukes to become a NATO country, which guarantees protection to all subscribed nations if attacked. But when Russia invaded Crimea, Ukraine got zero support. The country gave up its most potent weapons for a signed bit of paper, which meant absolutely nothing. Think Ukraine regrets that now? If you're not aware, Ukraine has never been a member of NATO. I don't know where Dave Rubin got that idea from. You want a real history lesson here. Um, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Ukraine sold the Soviet nuclear weapons to Russia. Ukraine never had a nuclear program and never had the capacity to even use these weapons. The Soviets did, but the Soviet Union no longer existed. Also, at the time, there was international concern that if Ukraine tried to utilize these or tried to gain control over them, then there would be immediate retaliation from Russia and or NATO. It's just colossally stupid. Here's another one, though, from the chapter. Don't worry, you're not a Nazi. This one is bizarre. So he tries to say, in obvious pandering again, to his conservative readers, Congratulations! I have fantastic news! You are not a Nazi! Thank you, Dave. Uh, as if that was ever in doubt. Let's look at the evidence. And the justifications he gives are astounding. Exhibit A. I'm guessing you're no fan of socialism, which was a founding principle of the Nazi movement. The name Nazi is an acronym for the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which most of today's Democrat socialists conveniently forget. Actually, that's an understatement. These people don't just overlook the truth, they've totally rewritten history on the matter. These days, Nazism gets associated with conservatism at the drop of a hat, but historically, it stems from the left. Adolf Hitler? An art-loving vegetarian who seized power by wooing voters away from Germany's Social Democrat and Communist parties. <laughs> Every part of that is wrong. No, it did not stem from the left. So let's just say the obvious thing. Um, Hitler seized power because he was appointed, not because he, he, he wooed voters away. Yeah, what Dave won't tell you is that actually it was the conservative and center party who joined the Nazis in voting for the Enabling Act after the Reichstag fire. This gave Hitler essentially unlimited emergency powers. The Social Democrat Party were the only ones to vote against it, as the communists had already been banned from voting in the Reichstag. Now in the early days, there was a wing of the Nazi party, which was a little more economically left wing. We call them Strasserites. They were all murdered. Yay! This is also ignoring the fact that you know, left-wing people were the first to go 
You know, the saying goes, first they came for the communists. Well, let's just ignore that, right? And this is hilarious because earlier in the chapter he says, See, we live in strange times, very strange times, an era in which people secretly hope you are a Nazi, because then at least they'd have a real villain to rage against. Unfortunately for them, supply doesn't meet demand, so they frequently turn to political gaslighting, a form of psychological manipulation that makes its targets second-guess themselves. That's literally what you're fucking doing, though. This is literally, like, two paragraphs apart from each other. I really don't understand how someone can write and just lack self-awareness like this. I am astounded. But that's not all. Let's give his other reasons. Exhibit B. Real Nazis hated gays and Jews to the point of mass extermination of them in purpose-built death camps. So it's pretty unlikely I would suddenly be their go-to choice for a bedtime reading. Even if this is a page-turner. Okay. Maybe. But let's hear the next point, yeah? Exhibit C, you've just paid about $20. Actually, it was about four. I got this book used at Goodwill. To learn my take on classical liberalism, an ideology that, if fashionable back in 1930s Germany, might have stopped the Third Reich before it even started. <laughs> <laughs> hair in my mouth. See, classical liberals oppose judging people based on their ethnicity or religion. They only judge the individual. I'm sorry, you say you're classically liberal and you don't want to judge based on ethnicity or religion, but in the previous point, you're doing just that. How does that work? Astounding. All right, let's skip around a little bit. There's also a point where he does a 1350. Yeah. That being said, it's still not racist to observe that half the homicides in America are committed by and against African Americans. There may be countless reasons behind this, and I truly wish things were different, but it's a fact. This is not racist. If anything, it's racist to ignore this and make the task of finding a solution even more difficult. Okay, so he said there may be countless reasons behind it, but he doesn't give a single one. So he just brings this up and then moves on to the next topic. Like, what the hell, man? Saying that the data exists may not be racist. You are correct. However, just bringing it up and not following through on it is kind of fucking weird. Just imagine you're at a party. Hey, did you catch the game last night? Oh yeah, it was pretty sick. Yeah, did you know that half the homicides in America are committed by black people? See, th that'd be kind of weird, don't you think? <laughs> now hold on, Dave, I know you're watching. I'm not calling you racist. I'm just saying that's kind of weird to write out. It's progressive activists who are banning people from having bank accounts, speaking at universities, and from social media platforms and crowdfunding sites. They have huge influence over the media and the political lobby. Their modus operandi has chilling parallels to the tactics seen in 1940s Germany, which is also technically cultural appropriation. No kidding. They've literally taken the horrific archaic ideas of the past and imported them into the here and now. This is true cultural appropriation, not whether you have dreadlocks or hoop earrings. So unironically, he's doing the whole they infiltrated our institutions thing. They have huge influences over all the media. The same thing as cultural Bolshevism. I may add. And the whole chapter is about, well, my point? The left's non-stop, casual use of the term Nazi to shame, defame, and besmirch is so indiscriminate, so scattergun, and so preposterous that you're almost duty-bound to disregard it. But the previous paragraph, you were calling the left Nazis and saying that they're culturally appropriating from the historical Nazi party of Germany. So Dave, do you, like, think about what you're writing? Each paragraph is supposed to kind of flow from the previous one? Did you just like spew all of this out and not put any thought into it? I am astounded. Let's talk climate change, yay! Or as he labels it, environmental issues. I have to say this section is not just like wrong, it's obviously horribly wrong. In fact, my notes say bad, wrong, Holy shit, dude. Disclaimer, I am not denying that global warming is real or that human beings aren't a contributing factor. I'm no scientist, so I'm inclined to believe what experts tell us. That said, I'm also a big fan of rational thinking. <laughs> and a sane middle ground. So when certain members of Congress declare we'll all be dead in 12 years, I prefer to reassure myself with the following. Then he talks about some random Stanford University professor saying we'll run out of food in the 1960s. 
Okay, I don't care. And then he talks about extreme weather. The world's death rate from extreme weather is lower than it's been in any decade since 1900, according to the Reason Foundation. From 1920 to 1929, there were 241 deaths a year per million people, but that figure reduced to 5.4 deaths per million between 2000 and 2010. This includes deaths by everything from hurricanes to floods and extreme temperatures. Um, Dave, how do I say this nicely? This is not a rebuttal. Less deaths due to extreme weather is because we have better technology than we did in the 1920s. Uh, we have radar. We have warning systems for extreme weather. We know when a hurricane is gonna hit so we can evacuate. We have helicopters to pull people out. We have the invention of air conditioning? How do you think that that is a good argument? The only case in which this would be a good argument is if you had like a senator or something saying, oh yeah, we're probably all going to die from extreme weather. And then you bring that up as a rebuttal. But ah, you didn't because I'm willing to bet there aren't any senators who've said that. That's also disregarding the financial cost it takes to like evacuate entire cities when a hurricane is coming and the financial cost of having to rebuild and repair things at an even higher rate. But I gotta say like the worst, the worst thing is, is the last one. Remember, these are facts he uses to back up his claims about environmental issues. Polar bears. <sighs> if you saw Al Gore's documentary, an inconvenient truth, then you'll be pleased to know the global polar bear population has actually increased since the 1960s. Interestingly, Al never mentions how he sold his failed TV network, Current TV, to Al Jazeera, the state-owned Qatari propaganda channel, for $500 million. Oh, and Qatar is one of the biggest oil exporters in the world. Strange, wouldn't you say? It is strange how you keep talking about Muslim nations, Dave. According to Danish environmentalist Bjorn Lomborg, I am so sorry. The greatest threat to polar bears comes from hunters who shoot between 300 and 500 of them every year, not global warming. Why should I care about polar bear population? Inconvenient truth? What? What are you talking about, Dave? Okay, polar bears, congratulations, you found one nice cherry-picked example. I really can't even understand how someone's brain would think that this is like a, a proper counter-argument, but let me give a real counter-argument. Let's talk about the mass extinction event going on. I don't know if you've heard this, but if you look at it, it's actually apocalyptic. We're currently living through a mass extinction event known as the Holocene extinction. We are losing animal species at a loss of 100 to 1,000 times the normal background rate. Oh, but don't worry, the polar bear population is increasing. This is something that, yeah, is unavoidably catastrophic. This is something that humanity is probably going to need a solution to. There's also a chapter, Stop Hating Straight White Men, America, and Western Values. Don't take your rights for granted, is a subsection. He tries to say the United States is, is good, okay, but he tries to do this in a really shitty way. First of all, we're not an imperialist country. The United States of America was literally founded on pushback against imperialism, which is defined as a policy of extending a country's power and influence through colonization, use of military force, or other means. How is that not the United States? That doesn't mean we're always perfect. There's no doubt we've made some big mistakes as, as administrations have changed. For example, most of us now view George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq in 2003 as a massive blunder, escalating into a war that cost thousands of Iraqi lives and millions of American dollars. But wait, you just said we weren't imperialist. And then he described us being imperialist. Like I said, he can't even get through a few pages without forgetting what he already wrote. This aside, much of our foreign military intervention has been good. <laughs> Just look at Korea, Vietnam, and both world wars, where our contributions secured much needed freedoms. Dog, if you want to talk about American foreign policy being good, don't cite Vietnam. What is wrong with you? Funny, he doesn't even mention Afghanistan here. None of these infamous battle sites are now satellite American states that we've colonized. Hint, they would be if we were imperialists. 
That's not what fucking imperialism is. Literally the definition of imperialism, which you gave, is extending a country's power and influence. It says, through colonization, use of military force, or other means. Yeah, okay, we didn't set them up as American colonies. This literally goes against the criteria you laid out at the beginning of this section. I don't know, man. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> One more bizarre thing. I know I'm like just making fun of him for like clearly not putting a lot of effort into like editing this and like proofreading it but there's there's one really bad thing that stands out okay chapter eight learn how to spot fake news maybe this is valuable right instead of just like actual fake news he mainly talks about bias in liberal media all right still let's hear him out but get this don't take my word for it though Let's look back at three of the biggest media hit jobs carried out in the past few years. First one, we all remember the Covington scandal of January 2019. This event saw a group of Kentucky high school students wrongfully accused of racially harassing an elderly Native American, Nathan Phillips. Okay, yes, you are correct. Those snot-nosed kids in MAGA hats weren't actually antagonizing him. Personally, I would have not covered that story because I think we should leave kids out of these things. Example number two. The same month as the Covington fiasco, the media found another case that was just too good to be true. As they always are. This time it was a hate crime against gay black actor Jesse Smollett who told police he'd been attacked outside his Chicago apartment by two men shouting, This is MAGA country! Who then tied a noose around his neck and poured bleach on his skin. Dave Rubin is also correct about this story. Uh, investigation determined it didn't happen. Now, example number three. These two cases, Covington and Smollett, were both unfolding at the same time as the Russian collusion theory. A drama that ran for two years, largely thanks to MSNBC's Rachel Maddow, who was desperate to convince her viewers of election rigging with the Kremlin. She, like many of her media cohorts, ran countless hours of coverage on the conspiracy theory that Donald Trump had somehow stolen the 2016 election with help from Russian officials every day about a new theory, a new email exposed, a new secret meeting taking place. Skipping ahead a little bit. Sure, virtually everything they reported about regarding Mueller's hashtag Russiagate and Smollett's hate hoax turned out to be false, but apparently that's just reporters doing their job. One of these things is not like the other. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the Mueller investigation. The Mueller investigation resulted in charges against 34 people and three companies. So far, there's been eight guilty pleas and one conviction. So, um, that's not fake news. Now you want to say Rachel Maddow uh, overstep things, okay, uh, uh, I'll give you that. But you want to lump all this in together? Nah. Ironically here, Dave, you're the fake news. How about that? Charges were filed against five Trump campaign members. You might remember Paul Manafort, Michael Flynn, Michael Cohen. Yeah! Or the charges against them fake news. But you see, um, Ruben doesn't mention any of that because he wants to control the narrative. He doesn't really want you to know about this. He just wants you to think, oh, it's all fake news. Or rather, that's what he thinks, so that's what you think. Okay. So that's the third example, right? The fourth example, I had this conversation recently with my father who's been a loyal subscriber to the New York Times for more than three decades and is finally considering scra scrapping his subscription. Ugh. After the newspaper did a hatchet job on me in a cover story titled The Making of a YouTube Radical. In it, journalist Kevin Roos cites a young man, Caleb Kane. Caleb Kane is also known as Faraday Speaks, who watches conservative YouTube content and suddenly flirts with neo-Nazism. The June 2019 article, which included a montage of YouTubers on the front page, blamed me, plus a host of others, including podcast host Joe Rogan and commentator Philip DeFranco, for radicalizing a generation into disliking women, gays, and blacks. You know the drill. He goes on for a few pages here, uh, complaining about this and talking about his tweets to the author. Kind of weird to put that in a book, I think. And to cap it all off, these three examples combined, which are just a drop in the bucket, help explain why trust in mainstream media is an all-time low. So, um, Dave, that was four examples you gave. He said, I'm going to give three examples. He gave four. And then he said, these three examples show why. So what I'm guessing happened was in an earlier draft of the book, he wrote about three examples. But then later in the year, the New York Times article that included him came out and he was really mad. So he, he said, I'm going to have to write a few pages about this. Then he wrote a few pages and then he just never went back to edit the rest of the chapter. 
Amazing. But now, to top it all off, let me read one final quote about fake news. So now that you know these types of fake news, test what you see against this checklist and consume it with a fresh perspective. Curating a list of trusted journalists will also help. This doesn't have to be static. It can change over time. But you'll want people who generally operate in good faith. To ensure this is their motive, check their output. Does it always reach the same conclusion? Does their criticism only flow in one direction? If so, take a step back. Reporters should be conduits for information, not manipulators of it. Dave, that describes you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I don't know how you can have zero self-awareness, but I am so glad I read the whole book through because that is an amazing quote and an amazing way to finish talking about this book. Let's move on to the next section. You just have failed developmentally. Neurological evidence in that regard is quite clear. By January 2018, my successes and failures had added up to be a net positive. I was finally doing work that I was truly proud of. As Ruben was enjoying his success pandering to internet reactionaries, his career took an interesting turn. In January 2018, the Ruben Report finally brought on both Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson as guests at the same time. I believe that we are fully right now in an idea revolution. To date, the live stream is still one of the Ruben Report's most viewed videos. It is of course right behind the second live stream with both of them. Peterson was speaking at the Orpheum Theater in downtown Los Angeles immediately after this Ruben Report live stream. Now, According to the book, Ruben jokingly asked Peterson if he wanted someone to do stand-up as an opening for him. And Peterson said yes, and told him to come to the Orpheum later that night. This is all the video I could find of that day. It's not very interesting. And then I went to Venezuela, and I saw a coach of Marxists They covered the universities. Oh god, imagine the smell. But apparently, it went so well... Ruben would join Peterson as the opening speaker on his worldwide tour. This gave Ruben's channel and career a massive boost. And he definitely noticed. We're all kind of growing together. Yeah. Although I gotta tell you, man, we crossed 600,000 YouTube subscribers, I think, on the same day. You got like 1.2 right now. I'm, I'm almost at 800. I'm stalking but, you, man. Yeah. <laughs> stalking you, good man. <laughs> all right, guys. That's Jordan Peterson. I'm Dave Rubin. Would you tell these good people to subscribe to my channel? Subscribe to Dave's damn channel. <laughs> yeah, he needs the subscriber. He's falling far behind. And he's feeling like a bottom lobster. Don't yeah. don't make me the bottom lobster, guys. I get it. He's the top lobster, but can we you like second level lobster or something? Poetic that that came from the live stream in Phoenix. Now this is going to be a little ad hominy. Ruben is not a very funny person. This goes back to the hot gay comics clip I showed at the beginning. His entire method of comedy is just pandering. All right, but I thought what I should do actually is take a little poll because I want to read the room. Uh, how many of you would say that you're conservatives by a round of applause? How many conservatives, conservatives, that's good. Look, that's great. You know, people with jobs and families. How many of you are libertarians? Libertarians. <laughs> yes, anyone that just applauded, those are the people you can get pot from at the end of the show. <laughs> libertarians love pot. How many of you, how many progressives? How many progressives? <laughs> I'm guessing there are, but I know because of the soy, it's sometimes hard to clap. How many classical liberals? <laughs> Those, of course, would be my people. Now, in stand-up, there's this thing called crowd work. Basically, just the performer engaging with the audience. I see a lot of you have coats on, yeah? Ooh, it sure is frigid in here. Just like my ex. She, uh, she's an organ. She's also dead. The purpose of crowd work is to make the audience feel engaged and establish something of a connection. It's often done by the host or the warm-up performer, but plenty of comedians do do it as part of their act. And... Here is my big criticism. Dave Rubin isn't funny because crowd work is all he does. It's all that he knows how to do. He didn't have a lot of success with it at the comedy clubs. His blog, his podcasts, his internet radio show, or even TYT. But he did have success translating it into politics, and he did have success translating it to Jordan Peterson's speaking tour. His success at his rebranding comes entirely from telling people what they want to hear. You have to accomplish something in a video game. You have to keep trying to succeed. Yes, can you go to Game Facts or can mm -hmm. you 
get the cheat code and all that stuff you do, but it really is about you figuring out how to do all this stuff. And that to me sort of shows why the media and especially the leftist media hates games now or hates gamers. They don't like people who solve problems. I think I, there's something there. Gamers sure. want to get shit done. Whatever world you're in, whether you're playing a sports game or an adventure game or an RPG or whatever, you're trying to you're building something, you're accomplishing something. You may have to have teammates and all do it. You don't want people to help you do everything and cheat for you. That's not what the left likes. Sure. So they have to not like games. I, I think there's something really there. Hey guys, Black Lives Matter. Fuck you. May 8th, 2018. Barry Weiss of the New York Times writes the unintentionally hilarious and laughably bad opinion piece titled Meet the Renegades of the Intellectual Dark Web. <laughs> They even took pictures of this IDW in the middle of nowhere, presumably before they started burying some dead bodies. I mean, that's what the dark web is for. The whole premise of this piece is basically just jerking off some internet podcasters who talk about conservatism but don't look like typical conservatives. You may object to that framing. I invite you to go away. I don't know that we are in the position to police it, Mr. Rubin said. If this thing becomes something massive, a political or social movement, then maybe we need to have some statement of principles. For now, we're just a crew of people trying to have the kind of important conversations that the mainstream won't. But is a statement of principles necessary to make a judgment call about people like Mr. Cernovich, Mr. Molyneux, and Mr. Yiannopoulos? Mr. Rubin has hosted all three on his show. This is such a tepid remark, I don't think it can even be considered criticism. Rubin would later cry about it. Rubin isn't having conversations the mainstream won't. He's just talking with nutjobs who have an internet audience. I guess this needs saying, but uh... Sometimes the reason someone doesn't get invited to talk on mainstream media is because that person doesn't have anything worth saying. I would have thought that that was obvious, but apparently not. Apparently some people believe it. Let me give some examples. I got back at everybody but one guy, but he went to prison before I could get to him. <laughs> so I was actually home when I was 22 and I saw this guy went into the bathroom and I was gonna go and just slam his head in. My friend goes, what is wrong with you, man? You're, you're, this happened when you were like 13, you're yeah. 22 now, you know? So, uh, side note here, I guess. I have not edited this and I have not adjusted the saturation. Mike Cernovich's face really is that red in this interview. Oh, you tweeted something wrong. Let's ruin this guy's life. <laughs> let's get him fired from, in, in many ways, let's get a guy fired over a tweet is probably worse than throwing a kid into a locker room because that guy has a family, and that's his livelihood. So this is Mike Cernovich. There are many things I could say about him. For example, I find him extremely creepy and every time I listen to him, I feel grossed out. But then again, maybe I shouldn't say that because if you criticize Mike Cernovich, he'll call you a pedophile and try to get you fired. He was the guy behind Pizzagate, the guy behind James Gunn getting fired from Disney, and the guy behind Sam Cedar getting fired from MSNBC. Both of whom were hired back. He also tried to do it to Vic Berger after Vic Berger made some fun of him. I might be next, who knows? He was also once charged with rape and has quite a few tweets talking about rape. So I can see why mainstream media wouldn't want to talk to this guy. Rupert, of course, had no problem talking to him and brought him on a few times. That's nice. Even called him part of a political center. There's also Stefan Molyneux. Molyneux alleged that Ruben agreed with him at some point during the interview, but that it was cut out. Assuming Molyneux is not lying, which is a distinct possibility, I can only imagine what it was about. Molyneux is an open white nationalist and cult leader. Here he is talking about different brain sizes and black people. No amount of screams of racism can be guaranteed to solve the problem. And I think, isn't that what we've seen? That, that the consciousness about race and racism has gone up so enormously. And, and good, you know, like this, there was definite racism in the world. Mm -hmm. But without this central fact, and it is a fact at the moment, even if we say it's 100% environmental, it's still a fact at the moment. You know, even if we say, but, well- But is there evidence that it's genetic? This is, yes. I, I'm not a geneticist. Yes. So, genetic in what regard? I mean, if we took, the brain of a 25-year-old black man and the brain of a 25-year-old white man, what is it that they're doing that... No, different sizes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And again, this is dependent on 
every ethnicity the higher IQ in general. There's lots of exceptions and so on. None of this is true, of course. He's just pulling it all out of his ass. But if you think racism and bigotry are just meaningless buzzwords, then this is the logical conclusion. Today's progressivism has become a faux moral movement hurling charges of racism, bigotry, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, and a slew of other meaningless buzzwords at anyone they disagree with. This is an important conversation that the mainstream media won't talk about. Isn't that right, Barry? And then there's Yiannopoulos, who actually supports pedophilia. This is an important conversation. Oh, uh, God. Cernovich, Molyneux, and Yiannopoulos are all so fucking creepy. Has anyone ever acknowledged this? I wouldn't want to be in the same room with any of them. If I were on public transit, if I were on the city bus and one of them got on, I'm getting off. Like, no, F fuck that. Let alone interviewing them. It's really strange that Ruben doesn't seem to mind. And he has very little negative criticism to say about any of them, even to this day, if he's ever said anything. That's something for you to keep in mind while he's talking about the left. The criticism doesn't flow both ways. So that's how you make a proper rebuttal, not this tepid bullshit that Barry Weiss wrote. The New York Times is much better without her. Besides, Ruben already did make his own statement of principles, but he threw it all out the window once he realized he could start getting views from these people. June 2018. Ruben would return to the Joe Rogan experience one final time. In my opinion, this is the moment that perfectly encapsulates what kind of person Dave Rubin is. Rogan said he wouldn't want the government to force cake bakers to make cakes for gay weddings. I don't think people should discriminate to the point where they're not going to make someone a cake. I mean, I think there's but something fucked up about it. do you think the government, the, do you think no. the government the should The government, tell, government shouldn't yeah. step in, no. Yeah. This made Rubin start going off on a few anti-government tangents. Every horror in human history is a government doing things. Most of which Rogan was relatively receptive to. I hate to tell you, but everything you just said there is completely against what Democrats basically are for. They are for the estate tax. The government doesn't do anything good. Right. Name one problem you could possibly have in your life, Joe Rogan, that you'd be like, get me get the government to solve this. Kind of funny he would say that. Dave Rubin's company, Emma Dog Productions LLC, would also take $80,000 in PPP loans so of course, when Ruben and people like him talk about not wanting the government to do things, they mean stuff that helps poor people. They're perfectly fine taking your tax dollars, though. Do they do the post office well? No. What, like, what do they do well? They do the post office pretty good, actually. But guess what? If the post office <laughs> closed tomorrow, it would be all right. You'd still get mail. Get, would Amazon suck. would pick. No, it wouldn't. Amazon would, would pick send that things up. Things through UPS, it would cost a lot more. It wouldn't though. Competition would start kicking in, and between UPS and FedEx and Amazon and drones and blah 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 mm -hmm. and DHL, they'd all start. It would probably drop prices mm -hmm. because right now we've just got this artificial thing that sits there that then allows them to price according to that. Until of course, Ruben mentioned a subject that Rogan just so happens to have some experience in. Bam! Just like that. Ruben crumbles. I'm not telling you that I'm against all regulation, period. That's okay. where, But that's where I said intellectually I like that argument because you could make it, I think you can make a very sound argument that competition would force people to do better work. Like if you're a plumber, you have a vested interest in doing the best plumbing job you can so that people will rate you on Yelp. Listen, man, I was in no. construction my whole life. My dad was an architect. Yeah. I've been in construction since I was a little kid. You fucking need regulations. These guys, a lot of people that are in construction, they're, they'll do whatever the fuck they can to make money, and it's not good for the people that have the house because they might have that house for five, ten years before that problem manifests itself. Ruben thought he was talking anti-government ideas to someone who already agreed and wanted to hear it, just like he usually does. Do you think that could be privatized then? See, because again, I'm not, I'm just, I just think it's the an interesting- regulations? Yeah. How would it? How that would you, you could have there would be no incentive. Well, no, you could have companies that would, that their job would be to, to make inspect. sure to inspect yeah and you but they hire... wouldn't have they wouldn't have the threat of law if you privatized it what's the incentive for them to follow the, the guidelines yeah so this is this is where i'm not telling you that i'm calling for all this i just think intellectually it's just an interesting space to to argue something yeah, um you but... know who you should have on to talk about this and i think people have looped you in before is yaron brook from uh 
from Ayn Rand Institute. Yeah, they're also backed by the Koch brothers. See, in Ruben's mind, he was working the crowd again. The moment Ruben gets pushback, he completely falls apart. He doesn't know how to present these arguments outside the context of crowd work. He doesn't have the experience. His entire career and all of his success is not built upon this. Tragically, this would lead to... And guess, then people like to get sneaky and use, no, I'm a classic liberal. Yeah, because oh, it's... Oh, what is that? What is that? Exactly. You're a fucking Republican. Ruben learned from all of this, and as such, he will not engage with people who are likely to challenge him in the slightest. And this is where you can start to see the cracks in him. Let's shine some light into these cracks. May 2019. Ruben does an interview with David Fuller of the YouTube account Rebel Wisdom. I would strongly recommend you watch the entire thing. Even Sam Harris has said in the past that he thinks that you might have been captured by your audience. And I, I feel that as well, just in the pieces that we're putting out. Mm. Like YouTube has a certain bias, and I can feel... It's something that Eric had said, that the members of the IDW are free because they are independent of kind of organizations. I don't actually buy that because there is, there's a huge pull in terms mm. of the audience, in terms of what they want. What, what do you think of that criticism by Sam? I suppose at some level, everyone that has an audience could have some level of audience capture. I would say, look, if I really, if, if I cared about audience capture to the point where I wanted this just to be about garnering a bigger audience to make more money and, all, and that sort of thing, I mean, look at the way we treat our YouTube channel. I mean, you sh anyone watching this could go look and we don't do clickbait. We treat the channel and the material that we put out the same way I treat the conversations here. So audience capture, I, I don't know, really, I really don't know what that means. I don't know how I, I truly, I don't know how I could be more honest with my audience than I am being. Sometimes you draw this you talk about a new center evolving, mm. but you draw that new center around some people that, that I would consider on the right, like Steph Stefan Molyneux, for example. Well, I've never said that Stefan Molyneux's in the new center. I really? mean, have you ever heard me say that? I thought you had. No, I've never no? said that. No. I would say that there's a, there's a beautiful thing happening right now, which is that if you are an old school liberal, like I consider myself, if you are a classical liberal, which means that you're, the things that you care about most are personal liberty and choice and free speech and individualism, you've suddenly realized, although it's taken a lot of work and I have a lot of work to do still with the left, you've suddenly realized that an old school conservative is actually not your enemy anymore. So five years ago, where liberals and conservatives were just fighting about everything, now actually there's a new center developing. And I think both of us are sort of in that, not in the exact same political part, but that's, but to me that's irrelevant whether we agree on everything or not. So Dave asked to show him where he said it. He said it within Stefan Molyneux's 2016 five-hour Christmas spectacular. Stefan Molyneux, of course, has since been banned from YouTube, and as such, this video is no longer available on YouTube. But that's where he said it, so... I don't know what you're thinking, Dave. I have often talked about a new center. I can tell you that the new center that I would um, envision would have nothing to do with white nationalism, uh, just as it would have nothing to do with radical leftism. So I don't know, that I have talked about the phrase new center, um, but I don't know that I've ever said this specific person is part of it. Would you say Mike Cernovich is in the new center? I mean, so these are, the, these are the type of questions that I, I don't think are that productive, actually, but I mean, I'll answer it. I, I don't think it's that productive because if we just start drawing lines everywhere, and I get it, I get why people want to draw lines, and I get why countries have borders. I mean, there, you can't just always be absolutely open to everything. Do we want murderers uh, in, in the new center or something like that? Of course not. I would say someone like Cernovich, who maybe has done some trolly things, or not maybe, has done some trolly things, has done some over-the-top things over, the, over time. He was also part of the machine that broke the fake news monster that we've been talking about. These news stories are fakes. They're definitely not fake. They're lies. They're not lie at all. 100% true. Jesus, maybe Dave Rubin really is living in the Twilight Zone. Because from what I can tell, Mike Cernovich is a fake news monster. As I said earlier, the, look, the bigger you get, the more relevant you get, the more haters are going to come out, but the more that legitimate criticism will come out too. And again, I address this all the time. What do you think is the most legitimate criticism? 
it's not really for me to say what the legitimate criticism of me. If someone wants to say that they don't like the way I interview or that I don't ask hard enough questions or something like that, well, I suppose that is a legitimate criticism of me. Some of these criticisms were also brought up in David Fuller's interview with Eric Weinstein. <sighs> and Rupin, being the mature pillar of a man that he is, and someone who can definitely handle criticism, LOL, that Fuller guy has a crush on me. Just reflecting what nearly every good faith observer notices about your tactics, Dave, as reflected in this very thread. If you could take criticism, things would be different. Did Eric sign a release form? Winky face. And of course, Dave Rubin would later block David Fuller. So we know Rubin says all these things about the regressive left, why he left the left, who's really tolerant, etc., etc. So why is it, do you think, he never brings any of these so-called regressives onto his show to hash it out? Did you debate Cenk or have a not, conversation with him off the air um, about this? No, we didn't because it just it just never materialized. You know what I mean? A lot of times when, although I did do the main Young Turk show with him a lot, most of the time as I was on it, it was because he was out of town. So I was either filling in or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't really the forum for that. E even the times that we challenged each other, like it was great. It was always great. And I hope we continue to do that. And I yep. hope you'll come on my show at Riot. And I hope I'm welcome back here. You know, I, the only reason, I know people want me to talk about it more. And I know people, you know, and I addressed it on the Joe Rogan podcast. Um, but... You know, it's like, on, on one hand, I think, sometimes I think, well, I should invite him on the show to hash all this out. Except the problem is that he's acted so dishonestly, e even just yesterday, I just saw it this morning, another thing that he did about Sam this morning, uh, that there's a video and I saw an article about it in Raw Story. It's like, it's never going to end. And if you've acted consistently in bad faith, then what's the point of me having that sit down? Um, so I would love to have one of these regressives, but I can't find one that acts in good faith. Um, which I guess is part of the definition yes. of, yeah. right? So, right. So I'm, I'm really asking for something that probably doesn't exist, you know? Just imagine how many views it would get bringing on old TYT people to talk with them. If you were to have a live stream and he brought on Jank Arana, it would be one of the most talked about live streams of his career, if not the single most. He has no problem bringing on some of the most heinous, disgusting, Disgusting far right people, yet he's silent about them and the threat they pose to America. Why do you think that is? There are some people who still seem to think he was a liberal or he still is. No, you're wrong. You fell for his narrative. He will never do it. He will never bring any of these people on. There are plenty of online left wing figures who would love a chance to go on his show. Dave. He won't do it. He'll never bring any of these people on because he realizes his ideas won't hold up to scrutiny. He will will, however, be a gadfly and ping all these other celebrities to come on his show. By keep it civil, he of course means will not challenge me in any meaningful way. Everyone in this list either has to be polite because of their career or they have better shit to do. There are also a lot of replies to the tweet telling him to talk to online lefties. Why are conservatives all afraid of Sam Cedar? He's not a scary guy. I think I could take him. Dave, of course, doesn't talk to any of these people and most likely never will. Hey Dave, this is a very brave move on your part. Kudos. Have you heard about the SJW nonsense? On the, uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't even care about those guys. Does It really just uh, honestly doesn't matter. Listen, I'm just having the conversation. Dave Rubin won't. And I love all people, rich or poor. But in those particular positions, I just don't want a poor person. Does that make sense? People often ask me what a shithole city LA has become under Gavin Newsom. Here you go. Unfortunately, as we all know all too well, the path Ruben has taken only goes one way. The path of irrationality. The path of radicalization. Can I tell you that there's no level of audience capture that I subconsciously can't even explain? Or the political PTSD you talked about before that yeah. you're kind of more focused on the left. Well, of course I'm more focused on the left. I believe that the, the, that the modern left, that the postmodern leftists, which now have taken over academia, which have taken over the media, which have taken over the political establishment of the Democrats, I believe that is without question the biggest threat to individual freedom, to liberty, and to human prosperity that exists. That is far bigger a threat than I think Donald Trump is or even could be. I think it's a far bigger 
threat than, than the alt-right or whatever that is. Yeah, this is just Nazi shit. Shortly after the 2016 election, Ruben posted this video. So let's see what happens. Let's see. Let's not, let's not prejudge. Let's not be prejudiced. Let's judge as things happen. If Trump does something wrong, does something illegal, immoral, any of that, I will be the first to hold his feet to the fire. I hope we can get Trump on the show. You might think it's trying to assuage some of the fears about Trump's victory, but he's working the crowd, a very particular crowd. He still called himself a liberal then. However, this would only be four months before his Why I Left the Left video. Four months before he decided to work for PragerU and take the oil money. Still, it wouldn't be all that long until... The election is coming. Let's talk about the Democrats first because there's really only two of them, right? Uh, sorry, Martin O'Malley, it's not gonna happen this time. Uh, you've got Bernie and you've got Hillary. So Bernie, quick. As I've said many times before, I really like Bernie. I think he's talking about the right things. So I am a registered Democrat in this state because there is so much Democrat power in this state and I wanted to be able to vote in the primaries. So I voted for Joe Biden, <clears throat> excuse me, in the primaries, but it was really just a vote against Bernie. I, I, that was what I viewed as this truly dangerous set of ideas. But I will tell you this, I also vote, you know, I voted against every single measure in there that increased taxes. It's good that he's finally being honest with himself if he's not gonna be honest with us. This is not someone who would respect any law that we have. I don't think he would accept that the executive branch, that the president is only one third of the government. I think he would do whatever he wants. The example I gave is that, you know, he's, because he says anything, he said, well, I'm gonna, when I'm president, uh, Starbucks is gonna put Merry Christmas back on, Chris, on uh, their coffee cups. That's a, cr I know, it's just a, he, I, I got you already. You know, like he's just saying something crazy. But I think that that line of thinking is actually dangerous. Isn't that what leads us to fascism? When you have a guy who comes in and says, I'm gonna do whatever I want. I mean, he's telling us right now, right? As for Trump, even after all these months of campaigning, I still have no real idea what he thinks about any issue. He seems to have a staggeringly low amount of knowledge about basic policies or how the government is designed to work. Many people, organizations, and institutes reached out to us after we relaunched to partner with us one way or another. We put them on the back burner though because we wanted to let the dust settle and make sure that we only collaborated with like-minded projects. One that really piqued our interest was the YouTube channel Learn Liberty. After doing a little digging, I quickly realized that they were a great fit for our commitment to free speech and big ideas. Learn Liberty is part of the Institute for Humane Studies, which was funded by the Koch brothers. In fact, it also has one of the Koch brothers on the board of directors. Whether or not you like Trump, his win was a huge rejection of the identity politics of the left. But don't take my word for that, Bernie Sanders said it himself. The amount of people I see talking about socialism positively is actually staggering. A tweet I sent out saying socialism isn't cool even got me into a little exchange on Twitter with the official verified socialist party who explained to me that socialism has actually never been tried, which is why we don't know if it'll work yet. Perhaps they should tell that to the people of Venezuela. What I think has to happen, the best way out of this right now, if you want to get out of this political mess that we seem to be in at the moment, I think if the, if the Democrats basically got destroyed so that it, a strong signal, if the Trump signal in 2016 was not good enough, a strong signal would be sent to them that the bulk of the country is against this hysterical mob nonsense. What is your opinion on Brazilian Prime Minister uh, Bolsonaro uh, uh, regarding, oops, there's a lot of things moving here, deforestation of the rainforest. P.S. I'm a Christian, I bake you a cake though. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about him, um, but it sounds like he really hates Marxism and he's, and he's really pushing Brazil to become more of a world leader and that he actually is for capitalism and he's trying to get some of the SJW stuff out of the schools. I just saw a tweet by him a day or two ago. So on that front, and I, as again, I don't know a ton about him, that all sounds good to me. At least that Hitler guy is getting rid of the Bolsheviks within our cultural institutions. Bullshit in a row. September 2019, Ruben signs on with Glenn Beck's Blaze TV. I, I've done a lot, I think, to save the word liberal. I think I've really tried, and I've been one of the people that have really tried to, to save it. So that, so that a guy like you or a guy like Ben Shapiro could say, yeah, in the true sense, I'm a classical liberal and, and that really is modern conservatism. 
So I would say more than anything else, in a way, I'm a modern conservative. If, if conservatism is what I now believe it to be, that it isn't that you have to buy all of these ideas, but you can have some outlier ideas, but basically believe in the bedrock principles of America, then I would say I'm a modern conservative. In mid to late 2020, Ruben went all in on the Trump train. I am in Beverly Hills, Beverly freaking Hills, and I cannot believe what is going on. All right, we got over 200 already. I, I swung by the, the Trump rally here. It is, it is absolutely freaking bananas. Look at this. This is Beverly Hills. Like we're in crazy California, LA. Rodeo Drive right over there. Look at these American flags. There's happy people everywhere. It's like the twi everything they tell you. Whatever they're telling you about a Trump rally, it, it's the reverse. This is the worst spinoff of all gas still breaks. We can throw up the image because it's out there already. I did vote for Donald J. Trump and Michael R. Pence. Do I think Trump is perfect? I don't. Do I wish sometimes he tweeted less? I do. Is there something kind of funny about his hair? Yes, et cetera, et cetera. I also voted basically no on all of the measures because everything increases taxes. Sorry, state, you can't have any more money from the people. This would ultimately accumulate in a live stream on election night 2020 in which Ruben would get completely wasted and thoroughly embarrass himself. This Trump win, it's a pushback on big tech, it's a pushback on mainstream media. Like all of you people who have consistently gotten everything wrong, you did it again, you got it wrong again, and you losers, and now I'm gonna do a little, this will be a little bit of a patting myself on my, on my own back. You losers at, at the Lincoln Project, like you people who, who clearly can't maintain an erection so that you then decide that, that you have to spend your life just being against one thing this orange man. Joe Biden's president. Ha 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 I guess this is where I have to shout out the Dave Rubin Clips channel. The person behind it compiled some great work of Rubin's election meltdown. Frankly, the more I cover this, the more it's going to come across as derivative. But here's what you should know anyway. After the election and after Trump's loss, Ruben wasn't quite sure which way to go. We can see him waffle around, unsure of what exactly to say. The Republican Party was divided into two camps. The traditional conservatives who recognized Joe Biden's victory and the Trump cultists. Regardless of who wins, I'm gonna do my best to be one of the few people who tries to heal some of this lunacy. I've been trying for a while, and sometimes I'm pretty good at it, and sometimes I'm not, but I promise to try to try. You're about four years too late on that, Dave. You were one of the leading figures promoting the lunacy. After waffling around a bit, Ruben didn't outright support Donald Trump in saying the election was stolen. He would say a bit that suggested it. There were hearings happening in Pennsylvania and in Arizona and in Michigan, there are all these hearings happening. There are people who have signed affidavits saying that they have seen fraud, giving specific evidence. Trump's lawyers made some pretty extreme claims yesterday that were then submitted to the court. So we're gonna show you some video on that. But if you don't hear about any of that, and then it starts going through the system, and then it's two weeks from now, and suddenly everyone's like, whoa, maybe something really did happen. Well, then you're gonna be set up to, to have a nervous breakdown. And I think half the country is, is heading in that direction, in case half the country's not having a nervous breakdown now. Joe Biden's president, ha <laughs> I am ready to roll. Like, I'm ready for the revolution, I really am. Like, if this is what these motherfuckers are gonna do, like, I'm, I'm here for it. Like, I am not going to be your bitch, Eric Garcetti. You have no right to lock me into my house, and I'm gonna live my life as I see fit. Uh, but before we get to all that, let's talk about Glint Pay, guys. I've been telling you guys about Glint Pay, and if you don't know, the world is in a very precarious spot. Dave Rubin, being the massive intellectual coward that he is, would never come out and outright say it. Here's the thing, though. It is over. Joe Biden won. And Joe Biden is the president. In June 2021, Dave Rubin would finally get an interview with former United States President Donald J. Trump. All right, President Donald Trump, welcome to the Rubin Report. Well, thank you very much, David. Great. Great to be with you. 
Uh, so, President, what are the chances that I don't get kicked off Twitter and YouTube and Facebook just for talking to you? Oh, I think you have about a 10% chance. Trump's out of options and nobody will talk to him anymore, so he's really scraping the bottom of the barrel now. But get this, not only did Rubin interview Trump, you can't even watch the entire thing. Think of the policies these people have. Defund the police, sanctuary cities, open borders, let anybody come into our country, criminal or not. And it's supposed to be all wonderful. And now cancel culture and all of the other things you're seeing on the school boards, right? And they're supposed to win. I don't I don't believe they can win with that. And no, you have to pay to join his website to watch the entire video. You used to be able to comment and post without being a paid member, but then that changed a little bit before the Trump interview. You can no longer interact with the community unless you give him money. His website even has microtransactions. You guys can find other people that are desiring to engage in the same kind of ideas that you want to and want to be respectful and decent. And by the way, by keeping it subscription-based, uh, even for only a couple bucks a month, whatever you want to give, uh, basically, uh, we're going to get rid of all the trolls because the trolls won't pay a dollar. The trolls and the haters, they won't pay a dollar. They won't even pay a nickel to troll you, right? And they don't want their uh, information associated with anything. So I think we're going to have an actual place where people are going to be able to discuss ideas. So if you come in here and you're paying just to start fights with people and to talk crap and all that stuff, well, we're just going to cancel your account, and I don't want your money, and that's it. Big tech? What about Big Rubin? Cancel culture. Trump didn't even respect Rubin enough to set up a camera and talk to him. The whole thing was literally just a phone call. One of the biggest moments of Dave Rubin's career. Literally just a random phone call for Donald Trump. How's that make you feel, Dave? Do you wonder why Rubin does this? Here's why. Rubin Report creator Dave Rubin buys modern, eh, mansion. Well, at least he's got a pool. It's a nice looking house, Dave. Not gonna lie. I really like the outdoor lighting. I do. It even has a home theater. Oh my god. Listen, you can have a nice house. I don't care. There's plenty of other nice houses in the neighborhood. I don't know who lives there. I don't care who lives there. But I do care how you made that money and i don't like how dave rubin did and this brings us to perhaps the worst thing rubin has ever done what will you learn what will you learn that your actions have consequences do you sense though that some in the media are uh rooting for the collapse of the economy and just that they view this as oh we we didn't get trump on russia we didn't get trump mm. on ukraine impeachment blah, I don't blah, blah, think blah. so that this no. you don't think so huh no I don't after the election Ruben would tweet this can we all admit that the pandemic is over now like at least give us that as you peddle the rest of this nonsense we have to decide what level of sickness are we willing to live with so to speak to move ahead and open the country because I don't know how much longer we can do this David that sounds ridiculous what level what? of sickness can we live with? Come on. You've got a well, there, world. We have to pandemic. figure out what that level How is. Who caused this? Or, yeah. but at, the, at whose risk? Yours or mine? You, you, it's okay if you die, right? Larry King would be hospitalized with COVID 19 in December 2020. He would die the following month, January 2021. December 2020, Ruben would post this. Guys, for the second consecutive day, a total stranger has served me food at a place called a restaurant. Truly incredible. Florida is the future. It's happening again. Third day in a row. You are a genius. At Governor Ron DeSantis. Day four. Rebel. Look at his smug face. God, what a narcissistic fucking prick. Even with the death of his friend, mentor, and idol, Larry King, Ruben is still on this train. July 2021, he posted this. They want a federal vaccine mandate for vaccines, which are clearly not working as promised. This got his account temporarily suspended. The death of Larry King is not going to stop Ruben or make him change his tune. Oh no. He's made his decisions. He knows what direction he wants his career to go. I believe that Ruben should not be allowed to live this down. Now I'm sure Ruben and... 
maybe some conservatives or whatever few fans of his might still be left, they might say, You're using the death of Larry King as a cheap personal political attack. No, I am telling you that this is where conservative ideologies lead you. Rubin sells a lie of individualism, one devoid of consequences or social responsibility. He's spelled it all out for us. This is where his ideology leads. This is where conservative ideology leads. He really got famous from Jordan Peterson and kept trying to run that. But the truth is, you're not the only person. Now I ask you this, when the next pandemic comes, and it is coming, what do you think people like Ruben will have to say about it. It is quite easy to imagine a pandemic significantly worse in lethality than COVID-19 has been. I do not have the confidence that people like Ruben will be able to address it responsibly and seriously. So hold on, are you the person who understands the officially codified doctrine of Islam? This brings us to the final chapter of this video. The very first words of Don't Burn This Book are for Ben, Affleck. Here we go. In 2014, an episode of Real Time with Bill Maher featured a heated exchange between Ben Affleck against Maher and Sam Harris. The topic was about Islam. This is what Dave Rubin calls his waking up moment for leaving the left. There is an entire chapter in his book dedicated to it. The cornerstone, the foundation for his beliefs. Every road, every podcast, every decision Ruben has made leads back to this, at least according to him. I recognize I'm kind of a slowpoke when it comes to getting content out. I'm only seven years behind on this one. The central claim of Harris here is that many liberals have failed to sufficiently address the history of human rights abuses within Islamic nations. When you want to talk about the treatment of women and homosexuals and free thinkers and, and public intellectuals in the Muslim world, uh, I would argue that li liberals have failed us. And that criticism of Islam is not inherently bigotry against Muslims, although an unfortunate number of liberals are seemingly unable to recognize the difference. The crucial point of confusion is that, that we have been sold this meme of Islamophobia where every criticism of the doctrine of Islam gets conflated with bigotry toward Muslims as people. Now, let's put aside what we think about that. Let's put aside the validity of that. I believe that that is a pretty fair summation of what Sam Harris is trying to say here. Ben Affleck, in an extraordinary lack of self-awareness, goes ahead and provides living proof of everything Harris just claimed about liberals. So hold on, are you the person who understands the officially codified doctrine of Islam? You're uh, the interpreter well, of that, well, so you well, can say, well, I, this I'm, is, I'm, I think I'm any- I'm actually well, well educated on this topic. I'm, yes. I'm asking you, so I mean, you're you, saying if I criticize the, you're saying that Islamophobia is not a real thing. That if you're critical of something- it, Well, it's not a real thing when we do it. Right. But we why have, are you we so have hostile to, about this? It's, it's gross. It's racist. It's, it's not. It's but it's so not. It's so. It's like saying it's those so stateless, not, shifty Jew. You're, okay, so let's get the obvious out of the way. Ben Affleck is absolutely unhinged here. Putting aside any external context within the confines of this discussion, Ben Affleck is in the wrong. Bill Maher pretty much had it right when he said this. You're not listening Absolutely to not. what well, we are saying. You... Affleck is not addressing any of the arguments being made. He gets mad and tries to argue against something that has not been said within this discussion. You guys are saying, if you want to be liberals, believe in liberal principles, right. like freedom of speech, like, right. um, you know, we are endowed by our uh, forefathers with an inalienable life, like all men are created no. equal. What the fuck are you talking about? I say tries. He doesn't really even make a full argument. Okay, uh... Surprise for all of you. I've never seen this episode of Bill Maher until I started doing research for this video. That's right. I used to have a life <laughs> before the dark days. Lest I sound like I'm being too charitable to Maher here, I kind of would have liked to hear Affleck and Harris talk about this and explain things a little bit more without Mar interrupting them. Can, can I, can I the, just express how I think it breaks down? The, 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 the idea, what are, you haven't even the, defined the, it. You're, you're trying to say that these few people, that's all the- Harris isn't the kind of guy who wants to engage in a large shouting match. He's a very timid and quiet kind of guy. Bill Maher, on the other hand, 
absolutely lives for this stuff. After a bit of back and forth between everyone, a visibly uncomfortable Harris says, Ben, we have to be able to criticize bad ideas. And of course we do. Islam, no liberal doesn't okay, want to okay. criticize bad ideas. But Islam but why at this moment when... is the mother load of bad ideas. So this is where I strongly disagree. I'd argue it's not Islam. It's conservatism. All these beliefs that they keep citing in reference to Islam, conservatism. Okay, to be fair, I recognize it's been like seven years now and the political landscape has shifted dramatically. So I have the benefit of seven years of hindsight, but no, the mother load of bad ideas is the Republican party. It was true then and it's inescapable now. Every critique they make about Muslims holding beliefs can be applied to the Republican Party. They talk about defending liberal beliefs and liberal values. Well, right now, the Republican Party is the single greatest threat to those liberal values to the entire world. To be fair to Harris, he would later walk back this claim and say that Islam is a mother load of bad ideas. But... During real time, you said that Islam is the mother load of bad ideas. Yeah, well, I mean, that was, that was the one moment in that exchange with, with Affleck where um, it seems to me I misspoke. I mean, it was, it was just insane the as opposed to a, you mm -hmm. know, because like, I obviously I've written, I've written more about Christianity than yeah. Islam, right? So I, I criticize religion in general. I think faith-based religion is... Um, the mother load of bad ideas. Hot take. I believe in the United States, there is an unspoken fear of mentioning certain things. One, a class-based analysis, or more specifically, a closer look at socioeconomics, because, well, that's literally Marxism. And two, um, America does bad things. If you mention either of these, it's essentially blasphemy to a large chunk of this country. Instead of acknowledging that the United States has a long history of destabilizing nations all around the globe, especially the same Muslim nations that Harris points to, instead of addressing what you are saying, conservatives will just accuse you of hating America. I believe this fear is why Harris won't address it. Instead, he reaches to blame the tenets of Islam. Afghanistan has a long history of being interfered with by world powers. Hey, how about that? I had something timely in this video. Who do you think it was who trained Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen fighters to fight the Soviet Union during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan? It was the United States. We did that. We propped them up, gave them a shit ton of guns and training. I know, again, I have the benefit of hindsight here, but... Holy fuck, my guy. You maybe want to bring some of that up? Okay, let's be fair. Harris is right. Blasphemy and apostasy should not be crimes. These are bad ideas that should be criticized. Yes. Of course, they aren't just from Islam. They're in the Old Testament, too. The punishment for blasphemy and apostasy in the Old Testament is death. I'm sorry, this is not about Dave Rubin. Let's get back on track. Okay, look. None of these people are especially qualified to talk about this subject. Ben Affleck, hi Ben, please don't sue me, I know you do that, is not a smart person. He's, he's not. He is a Hollywood actor, after all. Affleck is also an addict, and it has ran in his family. Now, I'm not bringing this up to denigrate Affleck, but it does put some of his behavior into context, which is extremely important for us because Ruben claims... It was a perfect wake-up moment for me because I had been having all these issues with the lefties and what was going on. I considered myself a progressive at the time. I was on the Young Turks Network. But there was always this overly emotional reaction to if you discussed anything that they didn't want you to discuss, you were a bigot, a racist, a homophobe, you know, all the litany of things that you could be. And when I saw Affleck doing it and he was red in the face and, you know, he was jacked because he was about to be Batman... And I just saw it was like watching this A-list actor perfectly act out the overly emotional craziness that I had been seeing from, from the progressives. And to launch an attack like that, not on a scary conservative or a scary religious person, but on Bill Maher, who's the biggest lefty we've got in America, and Sam Harris, who's a mild-mannered neuroscientist who I didn't even know who he was until that night, until seeing it. That was the first time I had ever seen him speak or even heard of him, I think. Um, to watch that reaction to those guys, it was like, oh, you guys really do eat your own and you don't want to honestly discuss uh, complex issues. And that was one of the, the couple wake-up calls that I, that I note in the book. So 
this is wrong in a few ways. Putting aside that Affleck clearly has some personal issues that most of us don't. Firstly, it is fallacious to ascribe faults to an entire political philosophy based upon a single presenter who's not very good at arguing for it. If I said all classical liberalism was just Dave Rubin, it would be a fallacy. That's why I also included Milo and Sargon. Bill Maher and Sam Harris also consider themselves liberals, but they handled themselves very differently than Affleck did. While fallacious, it may be relevant if they're a public figure leading a movement, like, say, a politician, or activist, or YouTube host with million-plus subscribers. But Affleck is not doing that kind of work. He's more of a hype man some Democrat candidates bring out to help draw a crowd. Second, I found out why Affleck is doing this. In opposition to these jihadists. Yeah. Rubin has claimed at several points over the years that Marr is a true liberal, and that Marr is one of the last few liberals remaining. So what, at this point, makes you a liberal Bill Maher. I mean, I mean this Bill Maher, if you're watching this, or your producers that watch my show, obviously. It's like, what makes you a liberal at this point? You, in effect, you're a conservative. As I have been saying forever, defending my liberal values is becoming a conservative position. It kind of sounds like Ruben just really wanted to go on Bill Maher's show. So anyway, to the producers that I know watch this, which is why Bill repeats everything that I say all the time, because even the stuff right there about national anthems and all that, like, yeah, I was doing it months ago. It's like, Bill's welcome here. We'll do it unedited. I'm happy to be on his show. I'm not attacking him. I don't even really want to be on the show anymore. I've been canceled a couple of times. I, I'm sort of like, it doesn't even, it's not even about me. I don't actually, I, I sort of retract that. It doesn't even matter. But yeah, let's, let's just take his word for it, okay? So. You're saying that Islamophobia is not a real thing. That if you're critical of something... It well, it's not a real thing when we do it. Right. <laughs> well, well, no, it no, really no, isn't. I, oh, yeah? It's not when you do it, Bill? New rule, if converting to Islam is all it takes to get the terrorists off our backs, then all I have to say is... <laughs> the most popular name in the United, in the United Kingdom, Brit Great Britain, this was in the news this week, for babies this year was Muhammad. Am I, a, am I a racist to, to feel I'm alarmed by that? Because I am. Talk to women who've ever dated an Arab man. The reviews are not good. They're violent because they threaten us. And they are threatening. They bring that desert stuff. So this is the last liberal, according to Dave Rubin. These are the liberal values that Rubin says the left has abandoned. Yeah, no shit! Before anyone had time to draw a breath, an agitated Affleck jumped in. But instead of contributing to the conversation like a grown-up, he basically shouted Harris and Marr down and called them racists, which now has become a standard debating tactic for most progressives. I'm sure Rubin would say that I'm now doing this, but I have not called Bill Maher a racist. I don't need to call him a racist. I just need to play clips of him and let the point prove itself. Maher has a history of saying racist and bigoted things, but for the most part within the confines of this discussion, no, he didn't say racist or bigoted things. How's that? Ruben has claimed in quite a few places that this kind of behavior from Affleck is typical of progressives. But you know, there were four liberals in this room and only one man is acting like this. This is your wake up call? This is what you're basing your change in politics on? I'm, I, I guess 25% is significant. Maybe that can be extrapolated to the rest of the Democratic Party. There's just one more thing. Do you see this other man? This is Michael Steele. He served as chairperson of the Republican National Committee. That's pretty much as high in the Republican Party as any individual can get without being elected to public office. If you've known politics for a while, you might know him as the guy behind the Fire Pelosi bus tour. He sat right next to Affleck as Affleck was going through his possibly steroid-induced mania. He was the closest person to witness the lunacy of the progressive movement made manifest right before his very eyes. The lunacy that ignited Rubin's political awakening. The very spark that made the wildfire that is Dave Rubin. The very moment that led him away from the left. One can only imagine what thoughts he might have after sitting next to Affleck and witnessing it firsthand. For four years, many have said there will come a moment. Well, this is the moment because this ballot is like none ever cast. Now I'm a lifelong Republican and I'm still a Republican. 
But this ballot is how we restore the soul of our nation, electing a good man, Joe Biden, and a trailblazer, Kamala Harris, and ensure an orderly transfer of power, or plunge our country into chaos. America or Trump? I choose America. I don't think that Dave Rubin is a failed comedian. In fact, I think his political awakening is his single greatest joke. Thanks for watching, everyone. Wow, I finally finished this. This is the biggest project I've ever done. Before we go, I would like to give a thanks to Acid Works and Bullprog for providing impressions of Dave Rubin. Go give them some love. If you enjoyed this video, uh, like and subscribe, I guess. <laughs> if you really enjoyed this video and would like me to make more content like it, help share it. Boost it to the top of r slash Dave Rubin. I don't plan on doing any more big planned edited videos for a while, but that could help convince me otherwise. And now I would like to give a thank you to every single person who has supported me on Patreon. Benjamin Kessler, Carl Bonney, Critch, Dios, Ian Diaby, Elsie Hupp, George, Irene Schaefer, James Paul, Jai Palamo, Jesse Colton, Joe Nuts, Joshua Moldenhauer, Ledigi, Laura Day, Lionel, Mellow Cheddar, Seth Zard, Suzanne Hendrickson, Susie M, Uncle Quail, Willowy Wings, and Xylorp. Uh, well, I can't. My brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high level important ideas. <laughs> oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> you got me. I just... get, get this again. Come on, come on, go. I have to say that my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level important ideas. When, oh. when did he say that? Was that recent? Uh, that was... <laughs> high-level important ideas. It was within the last year, and it was referring to a live event he did with the uh, Brett and Eric Weinstein. Oh, <laughs>